Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here, and welcome to our panel, Cancer Prevention, What Will It Take? My name is Wendy Selig. I'm the president and CEO of the Melanoma Research Alliance, which is a unique nonprofit that's affiliated with the Milken Institute. We were founded by Deborah and Leon Black only five years ago, and we're now the largest private funder of melanoma research. And obviously, cancer prevention is a very important topic to us because melanoma is a cancer that if it's prevented or caught early, obviously the outcome is a good one. And if it spreads and advances, prognosis has been terrible for very many people. I just want to acknowledge that our founder, Deborah Black, is here. And we also have a number of board members in the room. So thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm delighted about uh, the caliber of the panel that we have today uh, to talk about cancer prevention. How are we doing? What could we be doing better? And what will it take to prevent more cancers? not just in melanoma, but in any of the 200 diseases that make up what we think of when we think of cancer. At MRA, we invest heavily in research for treatment because, of course, that's such a huge unmet need. And this is true across the board for people with advanced cancer. But we also fund important research in the areas of prevention and early detection because we know that the best cancers are the ones that never happen. So today, I'm delighted to introduce you to our panel. Um, I just want to pull up slide one, if I could, and set the stage for us, and then I'm going to turn to them. Even though cancer is a disease that affects so many people, and probably everybody in this room knows somebody that has been touched by cancer, or perhaps you've been touched yourself, as many as two-thirds of cancers are actually linked to something in the so-called environment or in behavior or in lifestyle, something that we can actually control as distinct from something that we were born with in our genes. So these factors, tobacco, UV exposure, uh, our diet, and, uh, and other things, are things that are potentially within our grasp and within our control. So the real question is, why aren't we doing better? And what more could we do to prevent the million and a half new cases of cancer in this country a year? But it's not the whole story. And we have experts here who will talk about also the genetic component of cancer, what we're born with, people's risk, familial, hereditary tendencies. So all of these things need to come together as we build what we hope will be a much <coughs> more aggressive and successful cancer prevention agenda. So with that, I'd like to briefly introduce our panel, starting down on my far left, Dr. Len Lichtenfeld, who is the Chief Deputy Medical Officer of the American Cancer Society. And all of their bios are in your program, and you'll find out that this is a talkative group. So I'm not going to go into great biographical detail, but if you want to look them up, please do. Uh, right to my immediately left, immediate left is Dr. Sancy Leachman, who is director of the Melanoma and Cutaneous Oncology Program at the Huntsman Cancer Institute in Salt Lake City. To my right is Sherry Lansing, CEO of the Sherry Lansing Foundation, founder of the NCORE Teachers Program, and co-founder of Stand Up to Cancer. And on my far right is Dr. Stephen Gruber, who's the director of the University of Southern California Norris Cancer Center. So thank you again to all of you for being here. So I think I would like to start, Sherry, with you. Um, you know, in our world, we see a lot of data. We see a lot of statistics. We read the headlines. You know, this incidence is up. Prevention is needed here. This works. That doesn't work. But it really all comes back to the individual, to the person, and empowering the public and individuals and their families with regard to cancer. And you have obviously been a model for taking your personal commitment to cancer into making lives better for people. So I wonder if you could just set the stage from the perspective of the patient. <clears throat> you know, um, when you were talking, Wendy, you said um, all of us have been touched in some way. And if I said to you, everyone in this room has been touched by cancer, raise your hand. So raise your hand. You see, every hand goes up. So my story <coughs> is really no different than anyone else's. Um, it, it varies in the specifics, but it is a common story, sadly. Um, when my mother was 62 years old, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And she died two years later, when I was 40. And when I watched her suffer, in a way that really, to this day, gets me emotional to talk about, I decided that the only way that I could honor her memory is to, in some way, uh, become what we call a patient advocate uh, for cancer and to try and raise money for funding for research so that no one would ever have to suffer as my mother had suffered. Um, at the time, 
that my mother was struck by cancer. It's funny, I can remember as I'm looking out at you, I had this memory of attending a dinner uh, given by the American Cancer Society, and the a doctor there said, turn to your right, turn to your left, one of you will get cancer. And I paid absolutely no attention to it because I thought, I'm immune, you know, it's not gonna hurt me. And then it was less than a year later that my mother was diagnosed, and suddenly that statistic became a chilling reality. So since my mother's death, which is now 27 years ago, and it's as fresh in my mind as if it was yesterday, um, I've become an advocate trying to raise money for cancer research and cancer prevention. But the story doesn't stop there, because my own personal story told me that I was at very high risk uh, for breast or ovarian cancer. And so I began a screening program you know, I have a genetic uh, predisposition to the disease. And so I'm screened with mammography and MRI every six months, you know, as a prevention. Something that I wouldn't have done if I wasn't made aware of it. I also, ironically, while my mother was sick, which is really so ironic, developed something on my face which I thought was nothing. And I was so concerned about my mother that I paid absolutely no attention to it. And my secretary, who I will be eternally grateful to, said, you better get that checked. And I got it checked. And the slides were sent to a doctor who said, and again, this can happen. It's nothing. And my dermatologist said, I don't agree with this, this conclusion. And he sent it to a man named Bernie Ackerman at NYU, who was at the time a, a leading uh, pathologist. And he said, find that girl and get her in the hospital right away. She has what's called the carcinoma in situ, which means in any second it's going to be a melanoma. So I was one of the lucky ones. I was rushed in. They took it out. I didn't need chemotherapy. I didn't need anything because they caught it in time. And that led to every three months I stand there completely stark naked and they go through my whole body. I don't have any moles left on my body, I can tell you. But I am not going to die of a melanoma. I mean, it's really that simple because you know, I think it's almost impossible because every single bit of me is, is checked. So um, I'm a lucky one. I'm a person that benefits from medical science. I'm a person that benefited from early detection. I'm a person that benefits from constant screening. And um, I, I think that, that not wanting anyone to suffer like I watched my mother suffer and since then, like I've watched so many dear friends suffer and some win the battle and some lose the battle, is what motivates me every day for, for what I do to raise money for research as well as trying to get the word out about how you can prevent it. So thank you for setting the context. I think it's always really important to bring it down to the human and the personal because we're going to now talk about data and science and, and uh, policies. So I'd like to ask our medical experts on the panel here, given that pie chart and the concept of how much could be done, how are we doing in prevention? And if we're not doing as well as we should be, and I have a hunch that, that we're not, why is it so hard? So Fancy, yeah. how do we start with you? Yeah, I, I would like to pull up slide two, if we could, because I, I just brought two slides, so they'll be quick, but I think it sort of sets the stage from the sort of the perspective of how, how are we doing? on this. And I just want to also just say thanks, Wendy, for, for generating the idea behind this um, session because I think there's probably nothing more impactful and important than prevention, but something that's not quite as highlighted as you mentioned. And so I, I point, this it's kind of a little chart. Um, the real data is the, the half of the chart that says past. You see that? That's for melanoma. This is the, the rate of melanoma incidence and you can see it's it's climbing steeply mortality because of the the <coughs> gauge on the on the side of the axis it's, it doesn't look so much but it's also going up and the idea this is this is not actual data going in the future it's predicted data but you can imagine if you were able at that point where that arrow is if you were able to institute a prevention agent that was effective you would see not only a decline in the incidence of melanoma, so people wouldn't have to experience that, 
but you would also see a decline in the mortality. So if you look at the things that it can do, it can decrease mortality, it can decrease the morbidity, people don't have to get it, it decreases cost, it, it increases the quality of life, it increases productivity because you don't have to take off time from, from being sick, and it may increase lifespan. So why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we doing it? I have another slide, but I don't want to take everybody else's time, so I'll, I'll come back to it if you want later. Okay, so, so Len, maybe get in here with the whole cancer picture and I have tell two, us how we're doing. I, I have two thoughts. The first one is, um, I have to, my little plug here is I write a blog. And uh, if you go back and read the blog I posted, uh, just coincidentally, not knowing what you were going to say about data, uh, it was about a man who, who, who actually came to see me at a talk I gave in Portland, Oregon week, uh, last week. And he said, you know, when my wife was sick, all I heard about was the data, the data, the data. Um, bottom line is at the end of the day, to the point that man made to me was a human being. And I think we always have to remember that cancer for many, many of us is a very personal experience. For some of us, it may be as a patient and a loved one. For some of us, it's as our vocation and frankly, our avocation and our mission. Uh, and uh, so it all becomes very important. The issue of prevention is also very interesting to me personally. I was an oncologist, um, one of those things, and you may not even remember this. I've known me for a long time. I started off a career in oncology back when oncology was not even existing. I uh, didn't have any codes, didn't have any services, didn't have much we could do. And I did that for a number of years. And uh, frankly, uh, on a personal level, got to the point where I felt that there was much more to be done if I could prevent cancer in the first place. And I left, uh, left my oncology practice back in the late 80s. I had started in the mid 70s, having been at the Cancer Institute before that. I was in Baltimore and I started going to do general internal medicine because I was going to convince people that not only at that time, it was primarily prevention for their general health. Um, I was going to be able to convince them to change their lifestyle, to change their behaviors, to take charge of their lives. And boy, was I wrong. Um, there, it is fundamentally extremely, extremely difficult. We, we could reduce cancer deaths in this country by 50% without doing much fancy stuff with what we know today about diet, exercise, um, uh, plant-based diets, getting screened, adequate treatment, access to care. We could drop, it, uh, we could drop those rates by 50% today if we could convince our country, our nation, that this was a good thing. We could prevent a coming tsunami of non-communicable diseases around the world if we could convince the world not to smoke, not to engage in the lifestyles, that the, the, particularly in the developing worlds that we see. The reasons, they're complex, and of course we'll have time to discuss that maybe too much for right now. But the point I want to get to is, for years, and, to, and including today, right now, we have been stuck in what we call a culture of illness. This country has the greatest technology in the world to make you better if you get sick. This country is not the healthiest country in the world when it comes to life expectancy. And when we are able, you'll hear people saying this again and again, if we can convert this to a culture of health, to an environment of health to send the right messages, we can make incredible gains. And it starts right from there, right it's from, the, from how we view ourselves, how the messaging we get, uh, how we incorporate that messaging, how we treat our communities. We've had a long discussion previous the previous session at lunch about how issues about how we spend our money in governments, what have you. If we could create healthy environments in our, some of our communities, if we had access to even to fresh fruits and vegetables. And by the way, folks, it's not just about cancer. Uh, I have a slide that I'm not going to show right now, but it really fundamentally, what we now know that we did not know when I made my decision years ago is that the same things that account for high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, many of the same root causes that relate to cancer. So we need to attack this as a more global problem for the health of our country, and it's hard to get people to change. So Steve, I want to bring you in here. So every day you go to work now and you run a cancer center, and you see the people uh, who are being treated. But I'd love to get your perspective on how are we doing in prevention, and why is it so difficult? So the first thing I think is important to note is that prevention actually works. We don't even need to think about the hypothetical. We can think about the reality of today. One of the advantages of being at a comprehensive cancer center is that really is our mission to be focused not only on the state-of-the-art treatment for patients with cancer, and not only to develop the treatments and therapies that will lead us into the future, but also to concentrate on the ways in which we can effectively prevent cancer right now. And the good news is we already know how to prevent cancer. 
we know that we can prevent cancer with screening, medications, and even risk-reducing surgery. In some settings, risk-reducing surgery, for those who are at exceptionally high risk, reduces the risk of cancer of a particular organ to zero. For example, in individuals who have an <coughs> inherited predisposition to ovarian cancer, it's actually important and worthwhile to note that by removing the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, you can reduce the risk of cancer to essentially almost zero. And we do this in a way that actually takes advantage of our knowledge of biology and the life cycle to say, well, wait a second, we don't want to take out the ovaries too early, um, so what other strategies do we have? In fact, we know that oral contraceptives reduce the risk of ovarian cancer by 50 percent. So there are strategies we can use at different points in the life cycle and the lifetime to reduce cancer. And one of the ways we can do that is also to note that screening actually works. I, I love the slide that Sansi showed about the way in which we can think about the future of melanoma. But let's just think about the reality of today with respect to colonoscopy, mammography, and recognizing that they work. Colonoscopy reduces the risk of colon cancer by 65 percent. Yet only a third of Americans take full advantage of the screening guidelines, which we know actually work. So not only is it effective, it's also cost effective. And in today's environment, I think we really need to be attentive to ways in which we can look towards our country's future and the future of our population by protecting people from cancer in cost-effective manners. Okay. Yeah, please. I, I mean, because when you were saying this, I mean, and, and I totally agree. And, and what's shocking to me is that people don't take advantage of these things. I mean, you hear people saying, oh, I'm not going to have a colonoscopy. I'm too frightened. I mean, it's a painless thing. And you say, my God, you're not going to get colon cancer unless a doctor had an error, you know, but you're not going to get it if you have a colonoscopy every five years, I guess, is the standard, or every four years, whatever it's it is. It's every 10 years for people at average risk, but, yep. Okay, I guess when you get older, they make it shorter. I don't know. <laughs> but it and then, you know, when you were talking about melanoma, I mean, the thing that I, I remember was I'm never going in the sun without sunscreen, do you know? Mm -hmm. I'm never, I mean, anyone who uses a tanning bed today, and I'm sorry if somebody makes them here, you, you have to not be reading the literature. You know, anyone who smokes has to not be reading, do you know? I mean, they're just so, such obvious things, and it's so frustrating when you see young kids today, you know, just, you know, using these tanning beds with absolutely, no matter how much you tell them, with absolutely no self-awareness of what that danger can be. Well, I think, and I think it comes back to something that you were saying, is that it's how do you, how do you start to communicate message in a way that people can really incorporate change into their life not just to understand it it's just it's not just the knowledge it's the use of that knowledge to to Im improve compliance right and I think that um, we have to get our sociologists and our social psychologists involved and that's one of the things that um, in our program what we found and this is just another example of exactly what you were saying is that we had um, patients that are at very high risk for getting a melanoma because it's hereditary and it runs in families and we tell them all of the things that they need to know but yet they don't comply but as soon as you hand them that genetic test result they all of a sudden it trips some kind of a mental trigger that then allows them to comply with self skin exams to comply with the sunscreens and what we're trying to do with the social psychologist is to is to figure out what is that mental switch. It's the science of the mental switch, the cognition. And if you could figure that out, you might be able to apply it to the tanning bed industry issues and all of that as well. So sure. I, I, just while we're talking about tanning beds, if we could have slide number four. And then I'd love for Len for you to talk about, and also Steve, you. So one of the things that we know is that this is a, a maybe also a little bit of a generational shift. I mean, we saw, for example, what happened with tobacco. It took an entire generation before the societal norms really started to change. And this is just to, to put a visual, Sherry, on what you were talking about with regard to the tanning bed. So there's this youth <coughs> invincibility. There's this concept that it's not going to happen to me. All of these things, and maybe there's also the, something going on in people's brains. And yesterday we heard on the obesity panel that just knowing you shouldn't eat that donut is probably not going to be enough. So, Len, uh, talk a little bit about the tobacco experience. And is that generalize, generalizable? Well, that, that's interesting because uh, you talked about the obesity panel. I'm sorry I wasn't here to see it, but the, the folks are, I hope nobody's here from my lunch table. But if you were at my lunch table, you would have heard about the dessert. Um, and, I, and about the poor guy sitting next to me, and I said, you should, no, forget that. It wasn't a very nice thing for me to do. 
Uh, I, I sort of have this moniker from a couple of years ago called Dr. No Fun. The last thing you want to do is be around me. And for those of you with some gray hair in the room, you know your beer has no alcohol, your, you know, your coffee has no caffeine, your butter has no butter, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it becomes a lifestyle. It becomes, it becomes part of you, to tell you the truth. Um, tobacco is, is a one-time success, and, and, and Steve, you may have some additional comments relative to California on this. Tobacco at one, at one point <laughs> is a huge success. And tobacco, on another point, is a huge failure. It's an example of all the issues that we face. So the comment was made about kids and invincibility. And let me share with you. You go to kids and you say, you have a 50% a chance that you're going to die as a direct result of this habit should you continue. And they look at you and say, not me. I'm in the other 50%. So um, what we have learned from the tobacco, uh, the tobacco wars, literally, are, is that there are several things that do work. So we know uh, taxes work. Uh, the higher the tax, the, the fewer people smoke, and particularly vulnerable are young kids. So if you start smoking by 21, usually you will not, if you don't start smoking by 21, you won't be a smoker. That's shifting a little bit up into the college years. But taxes work, clean indoor air works, and I still remember I, I was, uh, took a, a, a leave from my medical stuff to do some business. I was out here in California back in the 90s when that all started here in California, creating cl clean indoor air environments. Um, and so, and the messaging works. So when money is put into messaging uh, for tobacco, the rates go down. M the money's taken out of messaging, and the rates go back up. Mayor Bloomberg was uh, discussed uh, back at the lunch session, and there are graphs that are really stunning that show what happened when he said New York will be smoke-free and the taxes are going to go up. And the kids, even in the Bronx, this is what really impressed me, even the kids in the Bronx got the message and the rate of tobacco consumption way, way down. That's the good news. The bad news is there's still resistance to some of those ideas. And the other bad news is that we've been absolutely flat in this country in terms of tobacco consumption among adults for the last 10 or more years. We're still running about 20% plus minus, give a percent up or down, of adults who are regular smokers. So we have stalled in that, in that environment. Melanoma is interesting, and skin uh, tanning beds are interesting. The number is about 17% of young women, your kids probably, or my kids too, 17% uh, of those young women uh, use a tanning bed within the previous year. And what we did not have that we now have, and, the, and in part because of the work of the, of the Alliance, um, is that we now know the data is much more solid now that tanning beds cause cancer, particularly in young women. The data that, that uh, Sansi showed in terms of the, the increasing age is about 2% a year. It's been going up for the past 30-some years. And young women in particular are vulnerable to these numbers. And so we have... So what we call so solid, more, much more solid epidemiologic data. Here I am talking about the data. I said, don't talk about the data, Len. But we have much more solid data. What that leads us to is now to say, how can we take the lessons of the tobacco experience and apply them to, to the tanning experience? Because when you hear some of these stories from some of these folks, I mean, you were extremely fortunate. That was an insight to cancer, out, end of it, no more. But for a lot of these young women that come in who are now in their 30s, and you get to see them in your role, um, you, they're, they're terrible, terrible stories. Can we say the tanning bed caused that cancer? No, we cannot. But IARC, the international agency that, that adjudicates these things, now says, as you may recall from 2009, that tanning beds are class one carcinogen. They cause cancer. Case closed, basically. IARC is fairly conservative. And this isn't a, uh, a maybe recommend, uh, comment, this is an absolute. So we need to, it really brings to the, the larger point, and for some of you this may not be comfortable, but it really does bring to, to the table the issue about the role, we're talking about the role of government. But advocacy, advocacy plays a huge role. And, it, and you know, I, I really, I'm coming to a business crowd, I'm going to talk about tobacco spending. I don't, don't get me off on that, guys. I'm just about to <laughs> go read the blog. But when you talk about the health of the, of the nation and the health of our kids, the forces, and you may not agree, and I understand that, but the forces, economic forces, arrayed against those who are concerned about the health of the public, those forces arrayed, arrayed against the public are huge. The messaging forces, dollars, are huge. And consequently, the, 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 the kids want to get tanned, they're going to get tanned, and it's hard for us to counteract that in the public yeah, arena. please do. And, and so Steve. The, I was just going to add to what you said. There's a bill on the California ballot, I think it's called the California Research Act, whatever, 
which is to add another dollar tax to uh, cigarettes. And all of the money that is raised from it doesn't go to the legislature. It goes right into cancer research, and their specific hospitals uh, are going to get that money. I cannot begin to tell you what the ads the tobacco industry are running. They've got $20 million just to defeat this right now. We haven't even raised a million and a half dollars, mm -hmm. do you know? So That's exactly right. I, I'm telling you, this bill went down once before. It has a good chance of going down today. And it's the, the, the tobacco industry, you know, I, I mean, I guess I'll just say it, they're just lying. I mean, they just are saying, you know, this is ridiculous, you know, the cigarettes don't hurt anybody, this is ridiculous, uh, the money's not really going to research, it's really going to, I mean, they, it's lies. But we don't have the money to combat it. So here's something that could really be beneficial to, to prevention, be beneficial to scientists and the group against it. So you take on the tanning beds, I'm sure that they're going to have all sorts of stuff. And, and that's what you're up against, it, as well as getting your message out, is the anti-messaging. Well, and here in California, you're also the first state uh, in the country to have put restrictions on the use of tanning beds. So you, you guys are the harbinger for the rest of the country. Did, Steve, did you want to get in on that? I, I did, actually. I wanted to say that two of the themes that are really striking home for me are behavior and policy. And we've heard about behaviors uh, from several of our panelists and policy from Len where it really is a combined effort that allows us to make substantial progress. And tobacco is the big one. I think Sherry's point just a moment ago that the tobacco companies are investing $23.5 million, $23.5 million in a vote no on Proposition 29. Here's just representative within the state of California, and we're all global thinkers here, but this is representative. This is the microcosm of what happens when we are looking across the globe with what's happening with tobacco. Raising the price of cigarettes reduces smoking in kids. And raising the price of cigarettes by $1 in the state of California would save 104,000 lives within the state of California. I can't think of any arguments against that. And that is actually policy. And then on top of that, we can think of all the behaviors that we can do to encourage those um, who have already begun smoking to quit and remain uh, quitters. And raise hundreds of millions of dollars for research if the bill passes. Yes. I think well, it's like eight hundred million dollars. Can I just I just want to throw in a win, a, a story about what happened in Utah because we just had um, a tanning bill that's a, a requirement for parental permission <laughs> passed. And we were told there is no way the, the tanning lobby did exactly what you said. I mean they went out to every one of their email lists and we were they, we were told this will never pass the Senate it passed. Okay? This will never pass the House. It passed. This will never go through and be signed by the governor. It was. And it was because, because the people got out. We at the Cancer Institute, and this is another function I believe, Steve, of the Cancer Institute, mm -hmm. is that, that we as a Cancer Institute can rally our patient advocates to come out and to be politically active, just like the Occupy Wall Street. I mean, these guys are dying to go out and try to be part of the solution. So anyway, that's great. just a good win-win kind yeah, of thing. That's great. <laughs> Let's so, hope we have the same result for the Prop 29. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a number of you mentioned screening. And I know this is about prevention, but screening is also a way to prevent some cancers. Mm -hmm. You talked about colon cancer. You talked about your melanoma. Uh, we do know that there are some cancers that can uh, be prevented before they ever happen. Um, but screening is so. Um, controversial for some reason and confusing and it's very confusing I think to the public and if you try to empower people and engage them it is very confusing to people to know what they should do and I'd love for you you all maybe start with you Sansi to talk about the distinction any person that you ever talked to whose cancer was discovered through a screening and it was an early detection and they've gone on to be treated and life goes on feels very passionately about advocating to everyone else they know that you should get screened. But yet for some reason, and Len, you mentioned the government, it's very difficult to get the government to recommend. And there seems to be debate among the scientists. And all of this leads to public confusion. So what can we do to clarify that so that we can empower people to do what they need to do to, to reduce their risk? 
Well, I mean, that almost feels like a setup for me to be able to talk about more data. <laughs> I, I think, I really do think that the answer is in the data. And I will say for the first time in melanoma, we have hard data that screening is effective. So this is, I'm referring to this study in northern Germany where they did for the entire population. This goes back to kind of policy that we're talking about. What, what is a good policy? Well, they didn't know. But what they did is they put in a, a very specific screening policy. The doctors that were going to be screening had to be trained to know how, how to do the screening properly, right? Then every member of the population over 30 years of age was invited to participate. 19 to 20 percent of the people in the whole country up in the northern part of Germany participated. And five years out, they had a significant drop in melanoma mortality, period. Okay? So, I mean, to me, I think that's pretty good data. And I think we should think about, okay, that may not work. What works in Germany may not work here, but it clearly points to the fact that screening is beneficial and it probably will save lives. What do we need to do to make it work within the system that we have here? And that's, that's where I'd like to go. So, Steve, can you weigh in on that about why it gets so confusing for the public and why it, get, why it seems like it's controversial? Well, there are a couple of issues with screening that are important to note, one of which is that when you screen for cancers, you will find more cancers. And that actually leads us to think about what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to save lives or are we trying to reduce the incidence of cancer? Well, sometimes actually finding an early cancer can make all the difference in the world. I think one of the reasons for controversy is that we've tried to develop national policies which are smart and national policies which make sense when do we start screening at a specific age for diseases like breast cancer or prostate cancer or cervical cancer. Well, I think the good news is that we are now learning that it's a changing world. How is the world of cervical cancer <coughs> changing? The world of cervical cancer is changing because we now have a <coughs> vaccine that works. When you are vaccinating against HPV, you are preventing cervical cancer. So let's just fast forward 10 years from now. Are we going to need to do pap smears, HPV testing, and DNA testing on every woman at risk of cervical cancer if the entire population has been vaccinated for uh, HPV at a young age? Actually, I think the answer to that will probably be no. In fact, I think we have to look at things over time and say, where are we and what are we trying to accomplish? <laughs> I heard it. I heard it. She's hearing a deep here. breath. And the, the one thing that Wendy doesn't want to hear from me is that deep breath. Uh, this is a wonderful conference. I'd love to come back next year. Can okay. we have a session on screening? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm being a little bit, uh, I think, first of all, I want to give a very clear message. I don't think this is the message you intended to say uh, because we've come out with a statement on this. For those of you in the audience who are concerned when you heard about HPV testing, no, no one is recommending changing any screening approaches for cervical cancer today. That's an important mm -hmm. message. Um, but we, you know, I, I, I've tried to think about how, how to explain this, and, and it really is difficult to explain all the confusion in a short time. Um, you may recall back in 2009 when we had the uh, events surrounding mammography when the task force came out and said uh, women under the age of 50 should not be routinely screened. Now we have the task force of the government uh, agency coming out and saying don't screen anybody for PSA testing and hopefully uh, with PSA testing because it, it's not effective and hopefully we'll have the final rule on that. So we could go into all of these things. We, we in science have not been very good at sending simple, clear, directed messages about areas where we have controversy. We know that certain screenings work. We do know that mammography saves lives. The question for in the, among the experts is which age group and how often should people be screened. We are not certain about PSA testing. The American Cancer Society says have the conversation. If you understand the benefits and the risks, then go ahead if you choose to go ahead, but understand what you're getting into. We know cervical cancer screening works, and we know the colorectal cancer screening works that it saves lives. So we have this very big confusing issue. But to me, it goes back to a very root, and this is, a, this is I don't want to get into all the history, but you know, some of us, again, in the room will understand this. I started my cancer career at a time when we had no screening. We literally had no screening that worked. We had cervical cancer screening. I should be careful about that. But we didn't have much else. Mammography was just taking hold in this country. And uh, you all have heard the business thing, your fairy godmother. If she sat down next to you, you know, or you had 30 seconds, what would you wish for? We all wished for a test that would find cancer early. We all believed that every cancer found early would be a death prevented, 
And here we are, in fairness to you all in the audience and everyone in this country, here we are all these years later from the 1970s and 1980s, and we're still not giving you clear answers. And I will share with you, I think that's a failure of our science. Uh, and when the messages get confused, actions get confused. People are not certain what to do. I think PSA screening is probably the best current example. Um, Helen Darling, who now runs the National Business Group on Health, when I was early into my position at ACS about a decade ago, I ran a session at the Institute of Medicine. She was on one of the reactor panels or the breakout panels. And she looked me right in the eye back in 2000, whatever it was, 2000, what's the 10 years ago, 11, 12, mm -hmm. uh, the, the two. One, or two. one or two? Yeah, and she says to me, when y'all, and, so, and she was responsible for all these Fortune 100 and 500 companies and their health policies. And she says, well, y'all get your messages straight, come back and give me a call. Well, here we are, all about PSA screening specifically, here we are all these years later, and the messages still are not as clear as they should be. So that's a failure of our science. And in the middle of that, we have people saying, what do I do? So the best, to, to, to particularly this audience, the best thing is to be educated. Understand what you're getting into. Understand what the issues are. You may actually have a better understanding what your, than your doctor does. But understand it's not perfect because the fairy godmother thing, remember I said, if we could find every cancer early, we'd save a life. And as Steve mentioned, we have found cancers early. The problem is that what we're now learning is that some of those cancers would never have caused anybody harm. So we, I believe, as a scientific enterprise and as a, as a scientific establishment, have an absolute, I would say, the moral obligation to do the research to help us understand when we get a cancer sample that we can look at it, that we can look at it and say whether or not it's a, a, a very serious cancer or one that probably is not going to cause a problem. And I will share one more thing and plug of the California Act. I had a conversation, and, and this is important to you too, I believe. Um, I had a conversation with, uh, with, well, with Brian Drucker uh, the other day. Brian Drucker is one of the pr premier people in targeted therapy in this country. He found Gleevec and all that uh, last week. And I was talking to him about the issue of being able to take the genome and understand to get to the point such as being able to tell which cancers are really, quote, unquote, bad cancers. Which cancers do we, do we have to intervene and how should we intervene? And here, and, and I'm say, we're talking about the, 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 the tipping point in terms of genomics and understanding genomics and looking at all this data coming at us. And they're sitting around struggling trying to figure out where the money's going to come from to create the databases that are going to be interactive to determine that they can take a look at all this incredible amount of inc unbelievable data. And here we're sitting and talking whether or not we can continue funding research in the state of California with the tobacco tax that will help get us down that path. We, my friends, I, I turned to him and I said, Brian, I said, how much is it, how, bi how big is the check you need? I wasn't going to write it myself. But you get the <laughs> idea. That we are asking those questions in the face of these other demands that we have and the opportunities we have to really embody prevention, embody the study and understanding of the cancers that we are now detecting and be able to treat people effectively. That we're even asking the question, how much does it cost to get that database up and running, I think is a, is a sad state of affairs. Amen. <laughs> So I, I think this is a perfect lead into my other slide. I was just asking permission to see if I could show the other slide. So if you could pull up slide three, because I think that what I would like to get out of this panel, I want to hear everybody tell me how to fix the problem, right? And so these are this is just my synthesis, and I'm coming just from one perspective, and I'd like everybody's perspective about what I see is that if you say there, there's successful prevention methods and you boil them all into a little ball, that group, you, it takes research to push that ball forward, it takes money to push it forward, and it takes market forces. And I think it takes a combination of all those things to push it forward, but we have all of these obstacles. So it's, it's a very complex, high bar for trying to understand how prevention, it's harder to do prevention research in some ways than it is to do treatment research because you don't know what's going to happen. It takes a long time. It, it, you, you don't have as good a model. It's all kinds of things like that. And the risk assessment is difficult. Plus, not only that, but there's little monetary profit for somebody. That, I mean, pharmaceutical companies aren't going to make a lot of money for a prevention agent. They're going to make <laughs> money when they get to treat somebody for years, right? And we have market forces that are coming into play, aging populations that are going to be more at risk for getting cancer. Quality of life is almost as paramount as the length of life, if not, I mean, it's in my mind, more important. So the quality of life is really important, but the tolerance among our population for a, a risk, 
So like if you take a, a drug that's a, a side, that has side <laughs> effects for a prevention agent, that's not going to be tolerated. Whereas once you've already got a, a disease, taking a drug that has risks is much more tolerable. So you put all of these things in that column and you say, all right, how do we overcome each of those? And I would like to hear, you know, how we as a panel and maybe the audience or whoever, if we have solutions to how to overcome those things, then I think, I think that's where we get that ball really rolling. So the other day when we were, when we were leading up to this, Steve, I'm going to bring you in on that point, we were talking about things like aspirin and mm -hmm. statins. And to your point about <coughs> what is the business incentive for prevention and right. for some of these preventive agents. I mean, if, if people could take a pill and think that that had a great likelihood of helping to prevent <coughs> cancer along with lower their cholesterol or whatever else. So can you talk a little bit about the way you did the other day about those examples and sure. how you see the model? So let's just th think about three examples of chemo prevention and three examples of chemo prevention where we're using medications to lower the risk of cancer. And there are actually three different examples because they have three different lessons. The first, I've already mentioned, oral contraceptives. We now know, without a doubt, oral contraceptives reduce the risk of ovarian cancer. They reduce the risk of endometrial cancer. And there are many women who should take advantage of oral contraceptives specifically for risk reduction based on knowing what their risk is. And here's the important thing. Um, when we figure out whether or not somebody is at average risk or increased risk, we don't offer the same prevention guidelines. And for those individuals who have an increased risk, often on the basis of inherited predisposition, these are now considered the standard of care. So oral contraceptives in individuals who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, the mutations that cause inherited susceptibility to breast and ovarian cancer, it's the standard of care. For individuals who have an increased risk of uterine cancer because of a gene that causes uterine cancer or colon cancer, it's the standard of care. But there is evolving research which really suggests that there are other medications which have extraordinary potential to lower the risk of cancer. And I'll just give two and I'll ask Len to comment because they're a little bit controversial. The first is aspirin. Aspirin, low dose aspirin, 81.5 milligrams per day, a baby aspirin, which is used to reduce the risk of heart disease, also reduces the risk of colon cancer by 50%. Now, there are lots of experts in the world and there are lots of experts in the United States, including a task force that reviews all the evidence and weighs, should we be advocating for aspirin in the entire United States population for everybody over the age of 50 to reduce the risk of colon cancer? And the evidence there is, again, I think, a difficult one because scientists haven't been communicating it clearly enough. Because the data say, yep, it prevents cancer, but it carries risks. Yeah. And in average risk mm -hmm. people, okay. maybe we shouldn't yeah, use that balance. So those are things where I say we're right on the cusp of being able to make those firm and clear decisions and recommendations. And finally, on the horizon, there are drugs like statins. The same drugs that are used to lower cholesterol are also increasingly recognized as drugs which reduce the risk of cancer. And I can tell you, having done some of that research myself, that is not ready for prime time and that is not FDA approved. So I would say we already have stuff that is clearly the standard of care. There are other things that I think should be but are not and other things on the horizon that I think hopefully with more research will be. And I'd just like perhaps Sherry and, and Len to respond to that. So I guess, and I don't mean to be critical, but as, as a patient, and that's, I think, what we all, as a normal person who's an empowered patient, do you know, who reads the material, but who's not a scientist, what has happened to me and, and to many of the people I know who are less empowered because they're not in the field really as advocates or whatever, so they're just normal people who pick up the paper. Mm -hmm. So I remember reading when oral contraceptives cause cancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was this whole thing about how it caused breast cancer. I remember being told, oh, with the tendency, you, you know, I was younger, then you better go off of oral contraceptives, they cause cancer. I went, oh my God, I was on them for all these years. So now I'm thrilled to hear that that it's changed. I read the thing on aspirin, I read the thing on aspirin, then there's something that comes out that's, and I've been taking an aspirin because of my father had heart disease, so taking it for that. Then I read something and said, oh, don't take aspirin, it doesn't help with heart disease, it really causes this, it causes that. So I think, you know, when, and again, this is not being critical, but often um, 
the, um, the science, the screening gets ahead of itself. Mm -hmm. as, as, you know, we talked about with prostate cancer, perhaps, you know, with, you know, with the PSA, do you treat it, don't you treat it, whatever. And there was a big push, uh, you know, less than 10 years ago for full body PET scans. And they were saying, if you have a full body PET scan, we can find cancer in, in, in you. Well, they did, only the problem, and not for me, but I mean for, for many people, it would have never hurt them. And then mm -hmm. they were going in and having part of their lung taken out, part of this taken out. And so, so the public, part of the confusion among the public is we don't know what to believe. Mm -hmm. And even if we're an informed patient, yes, of course we know we shouldn't tan. Yes, of course we know we should have a colonoscopy. There's some things that are really clean mm -hmm. and clear and simple today. Now, I hope they will remain clear and simple. So I guess what I'm saying is we look to you guys to, and I don't mean this disrespectfully because I think you're all extraordinary, to get your <laughs> act together mm -hmm. and to really kind of speak with one voice. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I yeah. really, really no, don't. And true. I know how very, very difficult <laughs> it is. And then yeah. as advocates, when the data is so clear, as it is, in, as you said, with colon cancer, with, sort of with the melanoma, you know, then, then the patient advocates and, and everybody in the world can, can tell you. If I went to my doctor now, I, don't, I think I get 10 different versions about whether I should take statins or shouldn't take statins, you know, and 10 different versions about many things. And that's what leads people, sadly, to often throw up their hands mm -hmm. and reject things that are so proven. Well, and, and in the case of, of even melanoma, you said that that's so clear. I mean, we still don't have a government recommendation well, for right. full body, uh, for body <laughs> check, and we, we still have FDA regulating tanning beds as if they were Band-Aids. So, you know, well. the government tends to kind of be, be slower yet uh, behind the scientific community. Well, and, and it goes even further than that. I gave a lecture to the first-year medical students okay. just a couple of weeks oh. ago. And I gave him the whole deal about how if you're prone to skin cancer, it's better to do vitamin D3 orally. And that's really, that's really true. I mean, the risk-benefit ratio is not good for sitting out in the sun for 20 minutes as a Caucasian person in Utah at high elevation. And I have a medical student raising his hand. About, well, Dr. Leachman, our, our um, internist that just talked to us said, we need to sit out in the sun for 20 minutes a day. Yeah. And you know, so it, it's, I guess I share your frustration. I mean, and I get so many people coming in with this that are melanoma patients that should not be out, you know, and the, the message is conflicted everywhere, and I, I don't know what the solution is to that either. But So is this a matter of the data? Well, is this a matter I, of funding for the science you know, for the data? Or just because we sit up here and say that I have a doctor from our name doesn't mean we don't get into these same situations <laughs> that you do. I want to promise you because, you know, the worst thing to be is my doctor. Uh, because I'm an evidence-based patient. And uh, my poor doctor came in, my internist walked into the exam room the other day with a, for a medical student in tow, and he says, well, we need to do an EKG, and we've got, I won't mention what else he wanted to do, but I can't talk about that here. And we need to do this, and we need to do that. And I sat there for the poor guy to take 20 minutes out of his day to listen to me tell him why he is not putting his finger where I, he wants to put his finger, because it doesn't make any difference. So I face these issues as well. I mean, I, I once had lesions on my chest. And I was told I had to get four scans, and, and I, I, I knew what the, I, I talked to the world's experts in this thing, and I told the, the doctor, the radio, I had a coronary uh, calcium score. I'm a high-powered guy who, like you are, and <laughs> went and traveling around the country. So my wife thought she'd find me dead in the hotel room one day because of my heart attack. So I had to prove I didn't have heart disease. So they found four little tiny ditzels on my thing, and they said four scans. I told them, no, I'm not doing the four scans. Number one, I don't need them. The evidence doesn't suggest it. And by the way, give me those scans, and I'll get cancer from the scans, and so more likely than I will otherwise. So we all face those issues. And you're absolutely right in terms of the confusion. We don't have our act together. We are not sending clear messages. And that's in no small part because the studies have, you know, Medicine is no different, I'm sorry to say. It's, it, it, it's getting better, but in some respects, it's no different than anything else. If you believe it enough, if you say it enough, if you're loud enough and you repeat it enough, the world believes your message. It becomes part of the culture. It becomes part of the medical culture. It becomes part of the lay culture, and the failure to do it brings disaster on your head. Mm -hmm. And imagine, um, uh, we saw that with mammography. Uh, and I was actually uh, on the advocate side in terms of, of against the task force on that one. We've seen it with prostate cancer screening. I'm sort of in the middle trying to be the judicious person in the middle uh, on some of that. I get plenty of opportunity, and, and so do my colleagues, and Brawley, our chief medical officer in particular. 
I, I, I wish our science was better. I wish it gave us a, a better answer. I wish we had better tests. We are going to get there, folks. We will get there. I mean, this curve is, we're, we're getting to a point where we will find that single cancer cell or close to it. Uh, maybe not in my lifetime, uh, hopefully in, in yours. But then we need to know what to do with that information, and that's where the science is just so important. So let's talk about prevention. Let's talk about simple prevention stuff. I don't know how many of you all have been around, how long you've been around for. You remember vitamin C with Linus Pauling, okay? That was going to cure everything. Didn't happen. They finally did the study. You remember vitamin E? We all took vitamin E. It was going to cure. Didn't happen. Uh, remember selenium recently mm -hmm. and vitamin E again? Didn't happen. In fact, I took them all. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we can, line our pills, we can line our pills up together. I'm still taking the beta aspirin. Carotene. Beta carotene is the one I'm coming to. Yeah. So here, and the reason she's saying beta carotene because it's legendary. Beta carotene is a vitamin, vitamin A, congener like sort of thing. Okay, so you know, whatever. The bottom line is a study suggested the, vi the, the beta carotene would reduce the risk of lung cancer in heavy smokers. All right? And it became gospel that it was going to reduce deaths in, in heavy smokers. Well, guess what we finally did? We finally did the study. And guess what happened? Unfortunately, because this is not humorous at all, the, the heavy smokers died at a higher rate than the people who took the placebo. Vitamin D. We had advocates, and they're well-meaning people. They're good scientists. I know them. They've been in my office. I've been in their offices. I've gone to the meetings with them. They loved me. You know, they, they really did. Because they thought that, uh, remember the vitamin D stuff? And they believed the vitamin D was the answer. And then the Institute of Medicine came out and said, well, maybe the science isn't quite there. So now we're doing the studies to see if vitamin D really, in fact, reduces cancer. We have not done our job as well as we could. We shouldn't be having all these things. And as a result, we have advocates who believe strongly, and we have people who are doubters, and we have a great middle group in the middle, including sometimes me uh, and, and people like me, who say, I wish we had better answers because mm -hmm. we, d we just have to do so the best so uh, about the money, but I, I'm afraid I want to make sure we've been talking about things that people can do and empowerment and those two third that two thirds area. I want to also talk about the one third and, and where the two come together and what hereditary <coughs> risk, genetics, and those kinds of elements of the science, which is also important. I mean, you everybody knows somebody who never did anything that they weren't supposed to do, tried to do everything that they were supposed to do as confusing as it was, and still got cancer. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the genetics and, and Steve also, uh, you, and, and the research, and where is the research going in terms of understanding risk and the things about the way we were born that we can't change? Right, well, I think, I think it's probably the most exciting. I mean, that's where I am most passionate about science and medicine is because I think it really does provide us with a, a chance, a window into looking into what we're at risk for and how we may be able to prevent it. And I think there's no, again, there's no, in my mind, better uh, example of an interaction between genes and environment than melanoma. Because we know that people have a genetic risk, a genetic basis for risk. And just being Caucasian is a genetic risk for, for melanoma, just being white skinned. And you superimpose additional risk on top of that baseline risk with UV light, right? But if we could identify more of the, the risk factors that you can't see, not the things like the fair skin, but the other things that you can't see that are a genetic basis, and understand what those are ahead of time, before a person gets the melanoma, then that's the power of genetics, right? Is that you can, you can do the genetic testing ahead of time, predict which people are at risk and what they're at risk for, and tell them, okay, you're the one that needs to stay out of the sun. And you, it doesn't matter so much, maybe. You just need screening every once in a while. But this is, the I think, one of the trickiest things um, that patients are facing. Um, and I'll use the BRCA gene as an example. You know, if you carry the BRCA gene, uh, you have a, a very, uh, like, 80% chance of getting breast cancer if it's BRCA1, am I right about that? And BRCA2 is less, and of ovarian. Um, knowledge is power, and knowledge sometimes can absolutely destroy someone's life. I mean, and this is, I'm not suggesting that people shouldn't get the test, but you say to a 20-year-old girl that you have a very unbelievably high chance because you carry this gene of getting ovarian cancer, that literally can destroy her life because the mo most safe re recommend recommendation would be to have your ovaries out. And yes, now you're talking to me about oral contraceptives, whatever. 
that's that's a, a kind of a scary situation. And so, and, you know, all these things where you get the saliva test and you can find every disease that you could possibly humanly have, whatever. I, I'm a person who does, did, did get that test. I'm a person who believes in knowledge is power. Fortunately, it wasn't available until I was a much older person, you know, but it's a very scary thing. And I'm not getting the test that tells me whether I have Huntington's disease and all that because I don't know what to do with that knowledge mm -hmm. except wait. Right. Do you know, because there's no that, cure. I think that that's exactly the place for the social psychologist that I was talking about a minute ago because if we can sort of learn, there are going to be some people who, who, feel differently. Everybody's going to have yes. their own way of processing that knowledge, that information. And if you can start to get at the cognition that's behind it and little tests of that person's tendency towards that cognition, you can then tailor the message specifically to that person so that they can hear it without you know, in order to make good lifestyle decisions. But, but isn't it a socially responsible, and this is what I've always felt, to get the test with diseases that are preventable. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Yes. In, in other words, yes. I, mean, I, I mean, to get to, Huntington's is a terrible disease mm -hmm. that has no cure at the moment. You can get tested for the genetic predisposition toward it. To get tested for a, a genetic predisposition to melanoma is a great test because it's a preventable disease. To get tested to something that, of which there is no cure. Well, but, but wait, would you really, but there are some people who feel differently than you. Okay, there are some people who actually want to know okay. about their Huntington's, okay. and I don't believe that I have the right to okay. say that that person shouldn't get tested. I think that it needs to be individualized. Okay. It needs, and, and, but there are people who don't want to know. So, 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 but what about the research, and, and what's the direction? Yeah. Because now we're in this place where yeah. it's, it's a very uneasy yeah. place. So talk so about the research. All, I would really just like to acknowledge how important what Sherry is saying in terms of how we think about the use of genetic information, in terms of caring for the person who's right in front of you. And people are different. People bring different expectations. People have different personal preferences. Some people want to be empowered by knowledge, and some people are afraid of what that will share with them. And I think our role as physicians and educators and genetic counselors is to be in a situation to be able to provide good information to help people make the decision that's right for them with respect to genetic testing. And often, and I would completely agree with you, there is no role for genetic testing if there is no difference that it would make, either in terms of the way in which you care for that patient or the degree of psychological relief that it would provide to that person. But I, I, I wasn't going to show any slides, but I'm going to show one. Would you pull up <laughs> slide 16 for a second? This is an example from colon cancer. And Let's just think about what is the risk of developing colon cancer for Americans. The risk in the United States of developing colon cancer for people at average risk is 6%. But if, you'd have, if you've had a personal history of a polyp, your risk of developing colon cancer is higher. It's 15 to 20%. If you have um, something called inflammatory bowel disease, and that is actually should be up just a little bit, your risk is actually quite a bit higher developing colon cancer. In fact, your risk is somewhere between 15 and 40 percent. And that's why people with inflammatory bowel disease need to have very regular colonoscopy, much, much more often than every 10 years. Then there are these two things at the bottom. Let's just look at the bottom one for a second. Familial polyposis. The risk of developing colon cancer, if you have the gene for familial polyposis, is 100 percent. Guaranteed, you're going to get colon cancer. And you start to develop polyps mm, at about the age of 12. Well, do you want to know that you have a 100% chance of developing colon cancer when you're 12 years old? Well, people would say, heck no. I mean, that's information you don't want to know. And these are children. How can they make that decision? Well, the reason why it's actually important is because when you find the gene, you can treat those kids so that their chance goes from 100% to 0%. How can you reduce the risk of cancer by 100%? You take out the colon. If you don't have a colon, you can't get colon cancer. And you're all thinking, wait a second, I thought I needed a colon. And in fact, that's what kids say. These are 12-year-olds. They're like, is everything going to be OK? And the answer is, yes. We just take out the colon and reconnect the pipes. 
And what it means is you go to the bathroom more often than everybody else. In fact, you go about six to eight times per day. But you'll never get colon cancer because you don't have a colon. And this is a situation where genetic testing is unequivocally the standard of care because we present, prevent 100% of colon cancers. And I'll just give you one story because I recently cared for a young woman, young woman, she's a girl. She was 12 years old and she had this gene. And her little brother had this gene. And they looked at each other when they got the test result and the little girl said to her brother, she said, well, you know what this means, don't you? And he went, yep, we're more like dad than mom. Aww. And we're both gonna get our colons out and we're gonna be fine. A year later, she was, actually not even a year, six months later, she was back as a cheerleader. It was just amazing. And they're both living happy, healthy lives. So genetics can really make a profound difference in the lives of how we can unequivocally prevent cancer. So why aren't we all ordered to take that test? Well, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sitting <laughs> over here, nobody's paying attention to me. I'm just very patiently sitting here, uh, waiting for an entree. Thank you very much. <laughs> Because the answer is, and so let's let's get a little let's let's take a look into the future and let's talk about where we are going to be because we are there, folks. Um, I was at an Institute of Medicine meeting a couple of weeks ago, and actually I, I sort of I, I wrote about this too. I always write about this stuff, so what I say here is public record. I don't feel bad about saying it. Um, the the they're now predicting that in the next several years there will be one we will have the capacity to do one million runs on genomic profiles of one million people a year or more every year in the next five years. I don't know what the numbers were how long ago. It was 10 years ago how many billions to get one gene. Mm -hmm. We're now going to be doing routinely across the board. Um, the test price I have now heard on reliable information in some labs is down to $1,500, That's which nice. exceeds, and these are by quality laboratories mm -hmm. who are going to be able to take your genetic profile, run the whole thing. Let me tell you where the downside is in all this, because there is a downside. I would look at that slide and I would say, uh, uh, the FAP thing, I get it, because that's a disease that we see, we know, we can feel. The Lynch mutation is something that people in this audience may have and they don't know it. And a lot of people don't take advantage of it, they don't realize the penetration mm -hmm. of that gene can account. I don't know what the current percentage is, but uh, you all, your geneticists, you can tell me. But a certain percent, not inconsequential percentage of, of genetic uh, familial colon cancers are caused by Lynch mutations. 2.5%. 2.5%. Yeah. We're not routinely yep. screening for that uh, today as a practice. But let me tell you what's going to happen. And the vision of the future is really one, Sherry, you think you're confused today? Come on back in about 10 years when everybody's routinely getting their genetic material run. And I'm being serious because we will find that all of us have a disease. All of us will have, not, I, you know, I think it's fair to say, a genetic propensity to something when that analysis is run. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. And the question about what we call the penetration of that gene characteristic, meaning is, is it really a disease for you to be concerned about that will cause you a problem is where our science is going to be, meet, that, that, that's where reality is going to meet the science. So what you start to see and you're currently seeing now by some of these, actually some of the companies, uh, there's a journal called Nature Genetics. And Nature Genetics comes out with a paper a couple of years ago, and there was a company in Iceland that was turning all of these, this research out. And the reason the paper would come out in Nature Genetics, and the next day I knew sure, shoot, and I could go online, and there would be the genetic test for the disease. And I remember one specifically about thyroid cancer. And they said, in Iceland, in these families and in this cohort, if you have this gene, you have an X percent chance of having thyroid cancer sometime during your life, because Iceland has very good genetic histories and they can trace the people back. The problem was 20 to 30 percent of the people who had the gene abnormality never did, had nothing to be worried about. They did get thyroid cancer. It was not a marker for them. So the, the, the issue of what we call in science sens sensitivity and specificity, that is finding the abnormality and then applying to the question, will you really get the disease as a result of the abnormality, is going to send us in circles because we're going to find out things. I may be over speaking. I'm, I, it's easy for me to talk because I'm not a researcher in this field. I could just talk about it. These are the experts. But if you understand what I'm saying, coming back to that volume of information, that terrible word that man said, don't say to me the data, the data, the data. But looking at the data and trying to sort through, and when we all have our gene profiles run and say, BRCA, got it. That's a serious issue. FAP, got it, that's a serious issue. 
But what about all these other things that we are going to find and how we relate those to individuals is going to be very difficult to do. So I want to I want to ask um, Sherry and then the scientists to comment on the theme that keeps coming up, which is there are a lot of questions. And the more oh, we know, yeah. it seems like the more questions there this are is, This be. is the answer. This is the comment that you make. And we got answers to our questions. And what we get are not solutions, but we get more questions. So, That's what and in order to answer those questions, we need to have quality research, and yes. we need to fund the research. And I want you to talk a little bit about going back to the beginning about engaging the public in standing up to cancer, raising money for the research to help support people like Sansi and people like Steve and everybody else out there <coughs> who really wants to go at answering these questions, so that ultimately we're not confused and we know what to do. But engaging the public not just in treatment research, but also in prevention research. Well, thank you. I mean, Stand Up to Cancer um, is an organization that was formed by seven women. I mean, we were no different than any of you sitting in this room. We'd all been touched by cancer um, in some way or another. Um, two of our members were actually battling breast cancer when we founded this organization. And it came out of a frustration. Um, which, um, again, I am not being critical because I think the doctors are extraordinary. But anyone who's been touched by cancer or battled cancer often finds that there's confusing information out there. And even worse, um, the doctor on the first floor of the hospital doesn't talk to the doctor on the second floor of the hospital. And I'm just picking hospitals. I don't mean them specifically. The doctor at UCLA doesn't talk to the doctor at Sloan Kettering, doesn't talk to the doctor at MD Anderson, on and on and on. So we were frustrated, and we wanted to do something that would change this. And we were all from Hollywood, so we started to dream. And if you are from Hollywood, you dream big. And so we thought, what if we can get um, one of the networks to give us an hour of commercial free time to um, do a telethon? And we can raise $100 million. And that's actually what we said, because we dream big. And then we got greedy, and, and then really we were just seven women. We all had media connections, so that is a slight difference. Um, and then we said, well, why should we just get one network? Why don't we get all the networks to do it? And um, we sort of told one network that the other network was doing it, and then we told the other network that the other network was doing it, and they all said yes. And so um, that was the beginning of the Stand Up to Cancer Telethon, which is now carried on all the networks and all the cable channels every other year. But then we thought, if we can get the networks to collaborate, why can't we get the scientists to collaborate? And that really was the breakthrough model that we were trying to do. And why do we have to have this frustration that we've just been talked about? incorrect information, confusing information, whatever. And so we decided to treat cancer like the Manhattan Project and to bring the best and the brightest around a specific area of cancer research. Now, obviously, we seven women were not going to decide what the scientists should, should be. So we have a gold panel um, led by a man named Phil Sharp, who won the Nobel Prize, and other scientists of equal caliber. And um, we raised a $100 million. Uh, we've raised close to $200 million now in the last four years, actually three and a half years. And we've given them out to dream teams, which you can only be a scientist from one hospital. It can't be more than one from each hospital, from around the world. And because the grants are so big, they're usually six to ten, even $15 million grants, the scientists are collaborating. They're talking to each other. They're sharing information. And actually, the scientists that used to hate each other are now traveling together. And so the model is working. And we're obviously hoping that this model um, will be adopted by the National Cancer Institute. In addition, we've engaged celebrities. And it's amazing what the power of the media and celebrity can do. So when you get. Laura Linney to say tanning beds are bad, people listen. When you get celebrities to say smoking isn't cool, kids listen. Mm -hmm. And they can change the culture. You need the right celebrity. It has to be somebody they respect. You need the right collaboration of media. And so <coughs> we've been able to get, not just through the telethon, but day in and day out, get media out there with amazing PSAs 
amazing events um, that really are getting the messaging out there about prevention um, in all areas. I, I think that when Katie Couric had a colos uh, oh. colonoscopy, that colonoscopy changed the face of colon cancer. I don't know any individual that has done more to change, you know, screening. When she got that on, you know, the morning show, it changed the face. I mean, everyone, you know, started to get tested. And I know there's some charts that shows pre-Katie, after effect. Katie, the Couric <laughs> effect. And so, you know, she's one of the founding members of Stand Up to Cancer. I mean, every day, everybody should be grateful to her. And she did it because she lost her husband to cancer, to colon cancer. So that was her motivation. She's a patient advocate. Um, in addition, just a plug for MRI, um, we also felt that what was also wrong, which we had to take responsibility for the cancer patient advocates, was that we were also all in our little silos, raising money, you know, the breast cancer was raising money for breast cancer, the Melanoma Research Alliance was raising money, whatever, prostate cancer. So we now partner with everybody and trying to bring everybody together under the same tent. And we have a wonderful partnership with the Melanoma Research Alliance um, that makes us thrilled. And Deborah's there. And we're very, very grateful to be partnering with them. And I think that's the wave of the future. So we just have a couple minutes left. And so I want to ask each of you a concluding question, which is, and be specific and be brief. It, we've talked about a lot of things here. We've talked about behavior. We've talked about lifestyle. We've talked about screening. We've talked about genetics. We've talked about the media. We've talked about science getting their acts together. If, and, we, and the money, and the importance of the money behind the research. So if we could do one thing, you talked about your fairy godmother, so maybe you've already answered this question. One thing that could really give a giant leap forward in cancer prevention, according, you know, the world according to you for, for now, what would it be, and who needs to do it? So Steve, I'm going to start with you. So I'm a medical oncologist, I'm a geneticist, and my answer is going to surprise you. Tobacco. Tobacco is our number one priority. We have to reduce tobacco consumption, not only here in California, not only in the United States, but across the globe. And who's going to take the lead? I think we're going to take the lead, actually. I think the state of California has the opportunity to take the lead um, by um, showing <laughs> Uh, legislative initiative and by focusing on those two themes we talked about policy and behavior okay. Sherry Queen for the day boy I, I don't know how to pick one I mean I, I, I that's a terrible answer that I'm gonna give you tobacco I want prop 29 to pass but I want everybody to get screened in the screenings that are so obvious um, it's just as appalling to me that everyone doesn't get their colonoscopy or their mammography when they're supposed to. Um, and then I, I, I can't pick one. I just can't. Okay. I mean, it's just not my nature. Lifestyle. I mean, how can you have a, go to a tanning bed? You know, how do you sit out in the sun? I can't help it. I mean, you know, don't be obese. Because, yes, tobacco and lung cancer it would almost eliminate it. But if you don't do all three of these, then people are still going to die. And I don't want mm -hmm. anyone to die from cancer ever that's my dream for my lifetime. Fancy? Well, um, I think if, if I had to pick just one thing, I think the thing that I think would have the most impact worldwide is education on healthy lifestyles. And that would include all of the things that Sherry just talked about, right? The, it's not just, it's diet, it's nutrition, it's exercise. It's sun exposure. It's the whole package. And it's actually empowering each and every individual with the education they need to be able to implement it. OK, Len, quick answer. Last <laughs> word. Last word and a quick answer just don't go together. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be an answer that you probably, I, I hope it makes sense. I embody everything yes. that everybody said. Everybody in this country should be able to say, I have someone I can go to to get my health care as a primary professional. Yeah. If we had that opportunity in this country for people to have access to care, to know who their doctor or their health professional is, we would be able to go a long mm -hmm. way towards dealing with this epidemic that we have in this country. And we as a nation, again, it goes on that list. Of the things that we don't have as a nation, when you think about what we should have as a nation, the failure to make sure that somebody can say, I know, for me, I would say, I know who my doctor is, and we're in danger of losing that entire primary care workforce. 
That to me would be the one thing that would get us on the track to get all these things done that everybody so correctly cited. All right. Well, with that, I want to say thank you again to our distinguished panel, to all of you for being here. And have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.